Enter the Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience presented by DraftKings 2022, the Open DraftKings picks and player by player preview. You want to hear about a player in particular? Well, hit the time codes. You can find them all down there. Jump right to it. Share the show around. That way you can get a ballot into the draw for the $500 cash giveaway. The annual membership for free to FantasyNational.com or a Masters Polo. You can find all the details in the nightly newsletter that comes out. It's completely free to join. Hit the descri- hit the description or the comment section. And go subscribe to that right now. All the updates, the wind, the weather, the ownerships, all that stuff is in there coming out every night of Major Championship Week. And don't forget to play Play in the Pat Mayo Experience DraftKings Listeners League. There's just over 1,400 spots remaining. Of the 6,000, there's $90,000 of rake-free guaranteed money in the prize pool this week. We got to fill it before this starts at... I want to say 1.15 a.m. Eastern time on Thursday. So we got to fill it before then. I got the highest confidence that we'll do that. Leave the rating and review to get in that giveaway as well. We're just over 800 five-star reviews on Spotify. I know you guys got Spotify out there, even if you have an iPhone. So just open up the app. Boom, five stars. We're on our way to getting to that $1,000 mark. We get to the $1,000 mark. 1,000 review mark. We get to the 1,000 review mark. Rick Gaiman, Kenny Kim, and Tim Andercust are on a cuss corner. I'll release it on Thursday if that's the case. I'll do that. Let's do it. <laughs> you, you don't want to miss the end is all I'll say. I've never seen Cuss so uncomfortable with the story in my life. Uh, wow. And he and he says some things that should make him very uncomfortable. The, the idea of uh, Kenny Kim and Cust, uh just talking to one another is is something that should be on pay-per-view. I would pay I would pay lots of money for that. Well, all you got to do is leave a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and boom. Plus, you get into the, uh, the you get ballots into the giveaways. We're here to talk about all the players. I don't want to keep everyone all night. I set the over-under at 129 minutes. We'll see if we can go under that. We're adding a new dimension into it this time. At the end of each player, we're going to give you a green light, yellow light, or red light on DraftKings, at least in Rick and I's opinion of who we're going to use in our player pools this week. Let's start it. Rory McIlroy is the most expensive player. On DraftKings this week, he is $11,100. He is also shaping up to be far and away the most popular player of the top five in pricing. I don't know if he's going to beat out Spieth, but he probably will. This is where a lot of people are starting their lineups. You look at his stats, everything points to him. You look at all the corollaries, everything points to him. He did not get to play in 2015. Here's the thing, though. I feel like we say this about Rory at every major, and then he doesn't win. Well, but he finishes inside the top 10, sure. right? I mean, he's, he's already got three top 10 finishes. His floor is about as, as high as it gets. Um, he, he is going to be able to use as much of his driver as he wants. If he wants to drive three par fours this week, he'll drive three par fours this week. If he wants to lay back to a full wedge number, which is something that he talked about earlier in the week, potentially doing that, he'll be able to do that. He has a lot of options available to him. That wedge play, that awkward kind of you know, 50 to 125 yards for these guys. That's been one of his most improved aspects uh, that he's had this year. And, oh, by the way, the one huge thing that's gone wrong for Rory uh, in a big way is when he misses left off the tee. You can miss left all you want at St. Andrews. It's generally not a a big issue at the old course. So, yeah, he's going to be popular. He should be popular. Uh, If we're playing traffic light, it's green light, baby. I mean, this is – the, I'm I'm happy to eat the Rory chalk here with as high of, of a floor as he has. So it's difficult. And Tambo and I will discuss this live, 9.15 a.m. Eastern time, Wednesday morning. If you got questions about this, you tune into that show. You can ask him, fire away. Tambo and I will sit at this desk as long as it takes to answer all your questions or I get too frustrated by stupid questions. That either or ends up happening. Major week, you get some pretty terrible questions on the go. John Deere Classic week, it was fantastic. Great questions. You know, the, the real people came in for that one. We're going to get a lot of people asking their terrible questions this week. But hey, that's fine. You can get banned for life. With Rory, for me, if he's going to be basically double the other four, that means Scheffler, Rom, Thomas, and Morikawa, and even three times as much as some of the others, I think that makes him a red light for me because I don't think 
that his overall chance of winning is double, triple, or I would say it's basically the same as the other top three guys, four guys uh, that we want to talk about here. Maybe he's a little bit more than Morikawa, but you know, Rory versus Scheffler, I would call that what like a minus 103 even money head to head him against Rom's like even money him against Justin Thomas is even money I think it's just a spot where I'm gonna bite the bullet and say if Rory beats me you know what it was stupid on my part we're gonna get to a few of those guys and I don't want to fade him just because he is popular I want to fade him because he is popular and I don't see a substantial difference between him and a lot of the top end guys additionally your lineup looks a whole lot worse if you use Rory and don't start lower uh, that's the other thing. Maybe I'm more bullish about some of the guys that are further down the board, uh, that I can, that I can pair up with, with Rory, because you're right. I mean, it's, it's a pretty significant clip to go with Rory instead of Colin Moore or Cow. 800 bucks doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it is when you start building this out. Uh, so maybe I'm more bullish on those guys and you're right that if you look at the odds, Rory's not twice as likely three times as likely to, to win this event. I just think that, this could not be a, a, a better spot for him. He's most likely to be in the mix come come Sunday, and he's most likely to get me top five DK points compared to the rest of these guys. Completely agree, and that's going to be the tough one. The thing is, will he be in contention on Sunday, or will he be in contention on Sunday after we look at it because he's played himself out of the tournament on Saturday? Uh, hey, those those uh, those make up points at the end of the games, right? The, uh, what do they call that? Garbage time in football. Those garbage time points, they, they count just as much as everything else. When he flies up the leaderboard on Sunday, never contends and finishes T3. I might be pretty happy with it. Yeah, that's probably going to look pretty good in your DraftKings lineup. And that's probably going to be in the Millionaire Maker winner. But I'm trying to get a little bit off the beaten path here. And there are just other guys I prefer at the top. One of them being Scotty Scheffler, who... I thought would come in lower owned than Rom this week, and that's probably going to end up being the case, although it seems like there's just a lot of people disinterested with John Rom, which I did not expect coming into the week. But Scotty Shepard is the second most expensive player. He's 11,000. Much of the same lineup constraints, if you use Scotty uh, that applied to Rory, are exactly the same. It's $100 cheaper. But I do think that he comes in with either half or even a little bit more of the ownership. I think he has just a high of a chance as winning as Rory McIlroy does at the old course. So sign me up for some Scotty Scheffler green light Rick yeah I think this is the the very natural pivot uh the $100 difference if you don't want to play Rory and you want to just pivot to somebody else Scotty Scheffler is the guy the two missed cuts that he's had recently are basically the two best missed cuts you could have he gains <laughs> strokes in the ball striking categories he gives it away around the green like it's not that big of a deal at all so uh when you look at the statistical profile uh Scotty is in the midst of a four or five month stretch of absolutely high end phenomenal golf. And he is clearly uh, to me, the Rory McIlroy pivot, if you want to be a little bit different. So because I gave Rory a green light, I don't think I can also give Scotty one. I'll give him a yellow light. Yeah, so that's the thing. There's going to be a lot of yellow lights in here, and people can take from it what they want. Then you can play in the Pat Mayo Experience DraftKings Listeners League, and boom, you can get some rake-free money on your hands if you make the correct decision parsing through all this information. I really like, I think there's two things I really like about Scotty here, and obviously it didn't come to fruition at the Scottish Open last week, and the wind does look like it's going to be down, at least of down. That can always change 24 hours from now or even during the day as play goes on. But I think that being from Texas, I think helps playing a lot of really exposed, windy courses. And I really like his around the green game for St. Andrews and open championships in general. I know that he can kind of pick it out of that thick rough like we saw at the U.S. Open or even at the Arnold Palmer Invitational when he kept saving par. But when it comes to like bumping and running and getting creative, I don't think that he gets enough credit for what he's able to do around the greens. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned um, his around the green play and just kind of his ability to make par from anywhere. That That is when I watch Scotty in person at the U S open, like that's the thing that stands out to you. He can be anywhere on the golf course and you are never in doubt that he's going to make par from there. Like he could be in the worst possible spot and he finds a way. And there are going to be some really tricky, awkward um, kind of shots that these guys don't practice on a regular basis. And he has all of them in the repertoire. And there's, there's no reason to believe that this, whatever you want to call it, whether you want to call it a heater or whatever this stretch of golf is, it, it's going to, it's not going to come to an end anytime soon. Like he's on top of his game. The advanced metrics are all great. And this should be one of the better setups for him. John Rahm is $10,800 coming in, at least at the moment. Like I mentioned, a little bit less popular than you normally see John Rahm. Somehow in my six of six lineups last week at the Scottish open, he was the guy that brought them down. It wasn't Tom Kim. 
It wasn't Fabrizio Zanotti. It was John Rahm somehow who brought it down. Bad weekend for John Rahm. I'm not too concerned about what happened at the Scottish Open, but, you know, coastal courses, European courses, these are kind of John Rahm's jam. But even when he won in Mexico, I feel like we haven't seen an A performance from John Rahm all year. Like, he won Mexico with a B-minus performance. And it just starts to worry me against all these other elites. And listen, if Rom shows up and dominates the field, I'm hardly going to be surprised. But he is Anderkurst. That doesn't help. So he's going to be a red light for me. Red light for me as well. I, I look at a couple of things. And we, we really have to split hairs here. You mentioned it. If John Rom wins, no one is surprised. But when you're splitting hairs to the top of the board, you realize that John Rom has lost strokes off the tee in two of his last three. Doesn't sound that bad, but when you realize it was 44 consecutive events of gaining strokes off the tee, you start to get a little bit concerned. His approach play hasn't been good dating back to the Players' Championship. He's been barely better than tour average. That's not what you want to see out of John Rahm. Uh, the pathway for him finding success this week, I think, narrows. And when you start to think about it, like, this is not... Tory Pines, right? John Rahm is great at Tory Pines because Tory Pines, yes, you hit a bunch of long irons and hit it high and stop it on the green. This is the complete opposite of that. It's going to be a bunch of 60 to 80 yard flippy wedge shots that John Rahm's good at, but I don't think he's the best in the world at. So uh, red light for me, I'll find different ways to allocate my funds. Justin Thomas is up next. Uh, I have bet Justin Thomas at 33 to one on the each way extra, which they got rid of and then had to bring back at worse odds, but I'm in on the 33. Uh, you can find him as deep as 24 still. He's $10,500 on DraftKings this week. He just stuck out to me. The back injury is the only thing that really concerns me. In the numbers that I've looked at, he is the number one player over the past 50 rounds. And just when I think through what I want at St. Andrews, JT, I mean, I don't like to say checks all the boxes, but he does check all the boxes. He has that creativity. He can flight the ball low if he needs to to get out of the wind. From 125 and in, he's probably the best player on the planet. Can he putt enough? Sure, why not? Uh, at his other Opens, he has not been able to do that. I feel like his past Open Championship history is getting in the way of people really jumping on board. It's that or the back. The back is probably the more concerning thing, or the fact that he was plus 10 at the Scottish Open. I'm just happy that he went out and played, and he looked all right through one round, had a bad round, happened to a lot of really good players last week. I am green light, full force on Justin Thomas here. I'm going to take the deep breath, and hopefully it turns out well for me. I think Justin Thomas is the most interesting guy here in the 10K range. You you, you nailed everything, right? Does he have the game to, comp to compete at the old course? Obviously. You know, I'm not a huge fan of those proximity buckets, but when you rank inside the top 10 of... 50 to 125, 50 to 75, 75 to 100, 100 to 125, 125 to 150, 150 to 175, and 175 to 200. Basically, anything under 200 yards, you're inside the top 10 on tour this season, uh, you're doing it right. And JT has all those dead hand wedge shots that I love to see. What I think is most fascinating, Pat, um, is if, if this was in a vacuum and you asked me to pick one of these guys, Justin Thomas would be very close to the top of the list. You know, we're going to get to our defending champion here in just a second at a fraction of the ownership. We're going to get to a very creative Jordan Spieth here in just a second. I think JT is like the X factor, most fascinating guy on the slate, probably wins you or loses you the million bucks. The thing about his ownership is I think it comes in at around 15%, maybe a little bit lower, only because with the way that lineups can be constructed this week, everyone wants to use Rory. How is that going to translate? I'm going to say probably 20%, give or take. 2% either way. But then you have that list of the guys that you talked about, and Morikawa is definitely not one of them, but you go Spieth, Xander, Fitzpatrick, 10, 9, 9, 9, 7. All the ownership is going to be sucked up by those four guys that you just can't build that many JT lineups if you want. So I think that while he's not Scheffler, Rahm, or Morikawa, he's going to be way off and way below the ownership of those guys. I would love that uh, because I would also like to take the green light on Justin Thomas. You know, the, the putter has not been good for his last two, but he's made tangible gains in that category. He actually switched kind of the, the style of neck that he uses on that flat stick. And it's, it's I don't know, freed him up, giving him a different look, whatever it is, it's showing up in the stats. So um, quite bullish on, on JT here and hoping that he comes in at lowest possible ownership. Yeah, I'm going to guess 14% for Justin Thomas yeah. and the DraftKings Millionaire Maker. Love it. Fire him up. Let's go. All right. Colin Morikawa is next. You've alluded to him a few times. The defending 
Open champion, the champion golfer of the year. He's my guy, and I am having cold feet about him just like I did this time last year, and he made me look ridiculous. He, like Rom and Scheffler, are projected way lower than everyone else in this range. He has the entire game that you want here. Do you want Colin Morikawa at a course where I'm going to conservatively say minus 16 is the winning score this week? Could be higher, could be lower. We'll see how the elements play itself out. I guess Justin Thomas falls into that same bucket of he can just kind of putt himself out of tournaments. But if Morikawa's got the flat stick going, you better believe he can win this tournament. But if he doesn't, I don't like his around the green enough to get creative with bump and runs, to get it close. That I feel like that he's at a disadvantage versus a lot of these guys here. Yeah, I'm I'm also more worried about um, he's still kind of fighting this baby fade versus draw swing that he has. He's in between shots at the moment. And when he was in between shots and things got sideways at the country club, it was a lot of misses to the right. A lot of misses to the right at the old course are going to put you in a horrible spot. I also do, you know, I'm not expecting like, 30 mile an hour winds, but I'm not sure there's a super ton of evidence that Colin Morikawa is a great wind player. Um, his I've seen his ball just kind of get swatted down in some of these windy type situations, which would also concern me if things start to kick up at a very exposed old course. I'm trying to convince myself to get to a very low owned Colin Morikawa pat, but uh, I'm not doing a good enough job convincing myself, and I think he's got to be a red light for me. I, I'm a yellow light on Colin Morikawa at the moment because I can always talk myself into Sir Colin. But in terms of the who is the contrarian guy that I want from this top tier, I just have more faith in Scheffler right now. And I think you should. I mean, Colin Morikawa, who I've, I've backed a little bit, I backed him at the U.S. Open. I mean, he's since the Masters, he's only had three good rounds. And all three of them were at the Country Club. He shot that Saturday 77 and played himself out of it. It's been a lot of pretty poor golf outside of that. And he keeps talking about um, about his trajectory and how it's not the trajectory that he wants and the ball flight that he wants. And that's, I, I know, I know. I'm flashing back to the way that his club interacts with the turf last year. And then he goes out and wins the Open Jam. Like, I get it all. But when I kind of zoom out, I, I just like to pivot the other guys a little bit better and there are three guys up here if you just look at scrambling stats which are not necessarily the most predictive but they do tell a little bit of a story over the past 50 rounds rom morikawa and zalatoris are piss poor in scrambling yeah. And uh, I mean, just think about it. That doesn't even, pa that or that passes the eye test on Colin Morikawa struggling to scramble, right? Is around the green play. It's not great. He's pretty good out of bunkers, but it's not great otherwise. And uh, we know he can get very cold with the putter and scrambling is a flawed stat, but this week it's kind of, more interesting than most other weeks because there's going to be a lot of times where you just have to get the ball in the cup. Tiger Woods has talked about that a ton about the old course. Roy McIlroy mentioned it a couple of days ago. Just put the ball in the hole and scrambling is kind of a stat that tells you that. So yeah, it's it's worrisome when you when you dive deeper into Colin. I, this would be interesting to parse out because I don't think that any stat service provides this. And I mean, this is something for uh, rickrungood.com if people want to go over there. I'm hoping that we can get it incorporated on Fantasy National once we get shot level data. But scrambling at courses where you really can't go out of bounds, I think would be, would at least help it be a bit more predictive. Because I mean, unless you hit it like the burn on one, like you're legitimately going to be scrambling around this course. Like it's not the same as scrambling at the Honda Classic when you're probably hitting the water on your first shot. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting, right? There's there's little places to go outside of uh, a few a few spots of bother around the old course. I'm just trying to think through the holes, but you're right. There's and, and also what I find interesting is you you can almost, we were talking about this before we went hot, like around the green is almost what, like 80 yards out now. These guys are going to be pulling putters and four irons and trying a bunch of different things. It, it's it's going to be kind of a weird week uh, to overlay stats onto. How much do you think that, I guess not necessarily old course experience, but how much do you think that open experience in general is going to play a factor this week? Pretty, pretty good. Yeah. So I, I think that, um, so what does the open always provide? It always provides you a very, very strong field. Uh, it always provides you generally link style golf where you get a bunch of options and you can play the ball on the ground. And sometimes you should play the ball on the ground. So I, I think that is, um, 
common amongst all the Rota courses. So I, I, I do think it's important. And you generally get, you know, you get windy conditions. You can get kind of crappy stuff around there. So, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's pretty important this week. Well, let's get to a guy who has never finished worse than 30th in an Open Championship. He's been a champion golfer of the year. He did not come through uh, my wager for him to win last year. He came in second place. It's Jordan Spieth. He's $10,000. Luckily... If you're worried about ownership this week, he had you know, melted down on the back nine. He had one really bad hole, and that took him out of contention. And I think that kind of curbed his ownership a little bit. That is not to say that he will not be popular this week. He will and should be popular this week. But with Xander and Fitz cheaper, then he just can only get to a certain level. I am pure green light on speed here. I think that these types of courses are made for him. And if he can just find his putter... And not necessarily be old Spieth where he makes everything, but how many times are we going to look at, like, if I don't take Spieth, I'm going to watch my TV and all of a sudden he's going to make four footy, four footy footers in a row and be like, man, I knew this was going to happen and I didn't take him. So I'm going all in on Jordan Spieth here. I love him this week. I'm with you. The uh, the putting's been fine. He's just like he misses the three. He just can't miss these three and four footers, which is like <laughs> the most devastating, the most devastating part of it. But uh, you're right, Pat. And and Jordan Spieth has talked a lot about this. The creative side of the brain. You know, you get to be an artist at an Open Championship, which allows Jordan Spieth to get away from the technical side of things. There's a lot of things that are going to happen this week with a golf ball that they that these guys cannot control once it hits the ground. And Spieth is very good at thinking through all the options. Just look at his Open Championship history um, if you want some, some, some backup for that. And yeah, I mean, he like punted away the Scottish. He played horribly and still finished T10. He was very much in the mix. A, a couple things, you know, if he if he doesn't yank one left on that par three late, um, I mean, he, he's, he's in contention to win this thing. There's just few scenarios that I don't envision Jordan Spieth making a lot of noise and being a part of the storyline on the weekend. So double green light on Jordan Spieth for Rick and I. Now it gets interesting. Xander Shoffley, winner of two and a Quarter tournaments in a row, I suppose. We count the J.P. McManus Pro-Am, which he did end up winning after the great round one and you know, still edged out Sam Burns. But it's so funny how the narrative can change on a player. We've seen it twice already this year, that Scheffler goes from a guy who can't win to a guy who can't lose. And now Xander, after years of being the guy who can't win a real tournament, now he can't lose. He's $9,900. I see very little chance that he is not the most popular player on this slate. He is currently a yellow light for me because everything in my being wants to not play Xander and just hope he has a bad week. But I just keep looking at Xander and thinking, how can he have a bad week? Yes, I believe that he is kind of another one of these critical spots on the board where um, he can make or break a lot of lineups. I love his wedge play, right? Outside of Justin Thomas, just the aesthetic of what he's been able to do with some of these short flippy wedges is phenomenal. When he starts hitting that, um, that ropey draw, he's going to get like 80 yards of run out at the old course. He's obviously very confident right now. So to me, this is strictly kind of a game theory conversation that we need to have. Um, we're going to get to a couple guys in a second that I think I am not as equally excited about, but I could get, I could get by with if Xander Shoffley ends up being the most expensive golfer on, uh, or excuse me, the most popular golfer on the slate. So I would put Xander Shoffley somewhere between that yellow light and that, and that red light, just in terms of uh, game theory. I think, I think there are some pivot spots coming up for us. And I completely agree. I like the lower $9,000 as well, but I don't think the, obviously like the way that you talked about safety with Rory, I feel the same way about Xander this week. Just how many lineups are going to start Rory Xander? Yeah. Like all of them. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's, that's what people are buying, right? They're buying the fact that his floor is like a T12 and maybe he just goes out and wins another one. If you go Rory Xander to start, you have seventy two and a half hundred dollars left for your final four spots. It's doable, but it's pretty tough at the same time. So you're going to see a lot of Rory Xander, a lot of Spieth Xander, and then a lot of Xander. The next guy at ninety five, ninety seven hundred dollars, Matt Fitzpatrick, who I like fine enough. But again, I think I'm more in love with this, but not necessarily in love, but I think that it's just logical to go to the bottom of this $9,000 area and try to get away. If I'm going to eat the Spieth chalk, and Spieth is my favorite of these three guys who I'm most definitely going to play, I feel like you need to be a little bit nitpicky about how much consolidation of these guys that you want to put in your lineups. Because if you go Shoffley, Spieth, Fitzpatrick, 
You have $6,800 left. And I don't think that's going to be like out of the realm of possibility for people, especially if they love that one cheap guy. And there's one cheap guy who everyone loves at $6,500. Now you're back into that same level and you get all three of these guys. I think it's going to be pretty common. I think it is too. And if you're trying to win all the money, it's probably not a path you can you can end up going down. I mean, the, the Matt Fitzpatrick... Um, option is is very appealing matt fitzpatrick is one of the best thinking players out there right he has charted every single shot he's hit since he's been like 15 years old and off the tee at the old course while distance is always nice like strategy and angles is 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 much better and that's what fitzpatrick is going to bring to this no hangover after the u.s open he's been piling up top tens for what seems like two years uh, finally got a breakthrough. I'm I'm very excited uh, to to opt to a green light for for Fitzy here. So I'm going to go yellow light for Fitzpatrick, and I think the more we talk about this, it's going to be a red light for Xander, green light for Jordan. God help me, Xander's definitely going to win now. I feel like I'm walking into a trap when I didn't take Scheffler at the Masters. That's just how I feel about Xander right now. That like I'm going to look so stupid on Monday. Uh, yeah, there's a chance of that. But hey, go, like even at, even at the best, like let's crank it up. Xander wins this like. 12% of the time, 15% of the time. You'll, I, I think you're, you'll survive it. All right. I mean, I survive losses every single week. I could probably survive this one. Will Zalatoris, he of the most undercursed player in the field this week, he comes in at $9,600. Inevitably, he will not be as popular as people think he's going to be because he's right below the three of the most popular guys on the slate. So $9,600 is interesting for Will Z. Obviously, we know what his major track record has been over the past three years, and especially this year. He has he has the chance to complete the Ricky Fowler slam of just being inside the top 10 of all four majors and not winning one. I don't like him as much at St. Andrews as I do at some of the other majors, at some of the other courses, but he just continues to prove me wrong week after week anyway if this becomes a birdie fest and it does get to 15 16 you have to make those five foot putts that i don't expect him to make all of those putts like the lag putting i don't really have a problem with it's the short ones and it's the same sort of concern i have with speed and with rory at the same time but zalatoris is just notoriously worse at that uh, yeah he's outside the top 150 and putting inside of 10 feet which is not great obviously there's going to be a lot of those this week i um, so like, I'm like a eight out of 10, uh, in terms of excitement on, on Will Zalatoris in general and at major championships. But I, like, I think Tory Pines is a better setup for him. We talked about it a little bit earlier with John Rom. Tory just asked you to hit, hit a bunch of long irons, which I think is better suited for Zalatoris's game. And I think that's where there's a bigger gap between him and the rest of the world, not necessarily in these shorter ranges and then giving himself a bunch of 10 foot putts that, that, that is a little bit of a recipe that. Um, if he were to go out and prove me wrong and and snap off and win this thing, which he's certainly capable of doing, I wouldn't be surprised. But I don't think I'd have I'd have uh, much investment, and I I would be even more impressed than I already am with him if he was able to pull it off. So Zalatoris double red light from you and I. Green light for me is going to be Cam Smith. I'm thinking about betting Cam Smith. I see him as deep as 28 to one right now. And if we talk about you know the Spieth magic, the potential Justin Thomas magic of what they can accomplish around the greens from in close. I think that he's the third guy in this category right now that if you need someone to hit a ball up up onto a different tier to get it to spin back to a whole four feet away, like Cam Smith around the greens, this is what he does. Uh, yeah, I've actually already bet him. So let's, yeah, we're, we're in the same boat here. I mean, think back to, um, I guess it was 18 on Sunday at uh, the players, right? Yes. Where he sprays it, sprays it right, then hits it, <laughs> punches out and almost knocks it in the water. And then he's in that awkward range where he just picks it clean and stuffs it to like two feet. That's, that's Cam Smith. Right. And there's going to be a lot of opportunity for that type of shot. And he hasn't putted well last six or eight weeks, but he putted well the last time we saw him. He's been one of the better approach players that we have. And going back to this situation, Pat, when Cam Smith goes awry, it's because he misses left off the tee. That is not a problem at St. Andrews. There's another fairway in the adjacent left, basically every single hole. So I'm with you. We've come to the same conclusion. I've already bet Cam Smith, and obviously that's a green light. Green light for me. And it's funny as it sounds, I think that players who do well at Kapalua can do well here. Yeah, I mean, that's like the next biggest greens in the world, right? They're not even close to the ones we're going to get at St. Andrews, something like 22,000 square feet on average. But yeah, you get a lot of uneven lies, a lot of large greens, a lot of long putts. And uh, Cam Smith certainly had his way around Kapalua this year. 
this is one player I have no feel for. It's Patrick Cantlay, <laughs> and I think that a lot of us are in the same boat. $9,400. The best case I can make for him, outside of him just being a fantastic player at every non-major, in the majors he struggled a little bit, is he kind of looks British. So, you know, that could be a real home field advantage for him. I It's honestly better than any analysis I have on him. Um, so I'm I'm like the cartoon character who just steps on the rake every time I play Patrick Cantlay at a major championship, and I'm happy to continue to do that. I, I don't understand a scenario in which he can just be great at all big events except for major championships and actually played well at the U.S. Open. So now his last, his last six starts, win, runner-up, miscut the PGA, third, 14th, 13th, fourth. Uh, the fourth was at the Scottish Open last week he is unfortunately not great like he three putts a lot which worries me but I, he is so talented across the board um i'll give him a yellow light just because there's that there's that three putt concern and the major championship concern but at some point patrick cantley is going to run off a bunch of top tens at majors yeah it's he's he pulled the scheffler and xander at the end of last year. And it seems like everyone just kind of forgotten about that potential upside that he possesses. And I'm not going to get there. It's going to be a red light for me because it's going to be a green light on Shane Lowry. I bet Shane Lowry at 25 to one. I think that he's going to be popular, but I just think that these are great conditions for him. And again, almost back to the motif of, I need someone who can handle themselves with creative shots around the greens and can potentially make enough putts. That's been the issue for Lowry now. This is the issue with the Irish Open. And as we've dated back, even at the US Open, you know, the ball strike was fine the putter was god awful and i think that he can flip it around on these style of greens i know it's you know very unlikely that an open champion from two times ago will win again but at this price he doesn't necessarily need to win if one of my higher guys if thomas or spieth ends up winning that i just really like full green light on chain lowry for me I'll, I'll join you there. Um, I'm glad you brought up the creativity around the greens because I think if if this was, it's so hard to get lost in the moment now that we're actually here and this is week of, but if you would have gone back to January and started plotting out guys who should be good fits for places, you would have certainly attributed Shane Lowry to the old course because of that creativity around the greens, because of obviously kind of the, the knowledge of playing in, in wins and on some of these slower greens on exposed golf courses and Lowry for um, some very small recent putting struggles. I mean, he's gained strokes putting within like eight of his last 10 measured events. So he can certainly roll the rock. Well, I, I'm with you. This, this is somebody who should have won the Honda classic um, before melting, literally melting down in the rain on, on Sunday. I, I think this is a really good opportunity for him to contend to make a lot of noise. Now we are out of the popular plays this week because both Cantlay and actually, well, Smith and Lowry are going to get our ownership. So is Cantlay. And now we hit sort of a dead zone. So pick your poison from in here because this is probably where the millionaire maker is going to be won. Live guys, guys in bad form, but all carrying an expensive price tag. Dustin Johnson is up first. He was the 36 hold leader at the 2015 Open Championship at St. Andrews. And I like Dustin a lot this week. Even to look at his U.S. Open stats, they were really good uh, in terms of ball striking. Everything else was not so great, but it just feels like no one wants a any of the live guys outside of like a, a handful of them. And Dustin just doesn't seem to be one of those. I'm actually flirting with betting Dustin to win this event. Uh, I think if you can get like a 6% Dustin at $9,200 on DraftKings, you're doing really well. So it's a green light for me. Okay. Um, I'm between a yellow and a red. I'd prefer to, to not get access to Dustin Johnson here. You know, I, I don't disagree with anything that you said, but it is a, a little bit worrisome that he has not been as good of a putter as he was when we saw him on top of the world. It, it, obviously when he was the number one player in the world, he was rolling the rock beautifully, but we've kind of lost that flat stick from DJ. And then you look at some of the, like, I don't, what, what do you do with two top tens or two top eights at these live golf events? Are, am I, should I be excited about that? Or should I look at Dustin Johnson and say, you were probably by far the best player in those fields and you should have done that. I am encouraged if guys top 10 at any event, I'm, relatively encouraged because I have to build my case for Louie here in a bit. I think it's far more alarming if you have bad finishes on the live tour. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. If you're Phil Mickelson and you like finish 43rd and 42nd, that's probably, that's probably not all that great. Um, but even zooming out a little bit, I mean, didn't play well at the PGA championship or the RBC heritage or the Byron Nelson. Maybe he knew like, who knows? It's hard to tell if these live guys, right. If they knew they were going to be bouncing Maybe they're not taking it all that seriously. I don't have a great feel for this. 
And for that reason, I'm, I'm probably just not getting there on DJ. I just think that the live guys present such an opportunity on DraftKings this week because it's either one of two things. It's either we don't know where the state of their game is at. It's all very confusing. How do we put in their early season PGA perspective versus what they're doing on the live tour? How competitive is that? Just a lot of question marks. Or I don't fucking like these people and I don't want to play them. The, both those camps are just drawing low ownership on all of them. And I think picking your spots with the right ones is a pretty savvy move. I do agree with that. There's a couple coming up that um, that that will be getting exposure for me for sure. And let's not lie here. As a viewer, as a spectator of the Open Championship, having one or two of these guys in the mix come Sunday is going to be fun television. Yeah, if like DJ and Reed are within two or three shots on Sunday and Rory's there and Spieth's there, uh, God forbid tigers there, my, my head will explode. It'll be on, they'll shatter every viewing record ever generated. Hideki is up next. He's also garnering single digit projected ownership at the moment. $9,100 was fantastic at the open championship as a very young man in 2015. He's 50 to one at DraftKings Sportsbook right now. I mean, everything outside of what happened in Scotland is DQ at the Memorial with the weird I don't know, white out on his driver, whatever the hell that was. Uh, he's been playing really well. It's going to be a red light for me on Hideki only because there's just others I prefer in here. If you want to not play Dustin and play Hideki, I completely understand that. I'm generally with you. Uh, red light here from Hideki. I know he's been a better putter this year, but I still worry about some of these longer laggy putts. We've seen him be a bit more inconsistent with his approach play, which is a little bit worrisome. You know, he lost nearly a stroke on approach at the PGA Championship. Uh, he was basically tour average at the Scottish Open in the two rounds before he missed the cut there. It's just not automatic that he's going to gain between six and nine strokes on approach anymore like it once was. So uh, I worry about Hideki. There's other guys I like more. I'm not going to have any exposure to him. It'll be a red light. Is a $9,000 Victor Hovland one of the players that you like more? Uh, generally, yes. So there's uh, a, a lot to unravel here. So at first you think, okay, his ball striking is uh, not necessarily magnified at uh, at the old course, but he's a very good strategic golfer. Who's going to leave himself with a lot of good looks. And then when you start talking around the greens, you know, it might be a little bit freeing for him to not have to hit, um, just a standard stock PGA tour chip and pitch shot over and over and over again. First of all, he's not going to miss that many greens. The, the average from 2015 was like 14 greens hit per round of the guys who made the cut. So you're just not, you're just not going to miss a lot of greens. And even if he does, he could pull putter, he could get creative. So I, I do think that this is a bit more interesting for a guy who like, I'm, I'm seeing his outright number creep towards like 50. It's just, it's, it's pretty nuts for a guy who has six wins and half of them are coastal courses. 50 to one at DraftKings Sportsbook as we speak right now. Projected ownership on Victor Hovland is lower than Brooks and lower than Bryson right now. It's crazy. It's crazy, right? I'm leaning red light. I'm gonna make it <laughs> I'm I'm gonna make it a yellow light solely because the leverage that he gives you if he plays well. And the one good thing about Hovland, uh, it's not that he's you know I was it last year's Masters? Now I can't even remember anymore. which one did he open with a triple? Was that two years ago? Oh uh geez. Time time is a flat circle at this point. It might have been two years ago, yeah. But the impressive thing about Hovland that year, and as we've seen at the Masters, is that, yeah, maybe he's not going to cash you his 50-1 to 1 outright ticket, but DraftKings scoring-wise makes a lot of birdies. Yeah, he's um, a lot of birdie streaks. I pulled it up the other day. I think the top three, the guys who make the most birdie streaks are like Justin Thomas, John Rahm, and Victor Hovland. Like he, they just pile them up, and he often outperforms his finishing position with fantasy points. And... It's a lack of creativity, potentially. There's I've never seen from him around the greens that you know, that's sort of the motif that I'm building my lineups with this week. That's the one, one thing that I really want to go in on, and I just don't think that he has it. And I don't know about Sam Burns either. I think that Sam Burns will be like popular, but not too crazy at the same time. Of this grouping, he's likely to be the most popular, but... I just have no feel for how he's going to do here. He played like, okay, at the Genesis until he didn't. But he ended up, it was a lot like Morikawa last year where he just kind of made the cut and went away on the weekend. So I'm not going to hold that against him. But 
I just feel like there's others I like more. I agree with you. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Sam Burns in general, but it's got to be a red light this week. He's not driving it as well as he has been. He's not hitting his second shots as well as we've seen. He's coughing up a lot of strokes around the green. We still, you know, he's got a 20th and a 27th, I think, at uh, the last two majors that he's played. But, like, there's still, for me, like, uh, is he going to pop off and finish inside the top 10? Is he going to actually be in the mix at a major championship? I We have yet to, to really see that. And... Yeah, we're going to get to some guys that I'm much more bullish on. So uh, I'll catch Sam Burns further down the road. Let's get to one right now. Liv Tor Louie coming in at 8800 bucks, sub 10% ownership. I've written about this and talked about it at Nalism this week, whether you read my columns on DK Nation, my newsletter. Go sub to that, by the way, and find out all the nightly information and all the final thoughts and bets and DraftKings ownership coming Wednesday night. But... I mean, he has a first and a second at this course. I don't really care about that. It's nice. It's better than him coming dead last in both those tournaments. But it's just sort of the turnaround. When you talk about the Live Tour, I do put some stock into how Louis has played on the Live Tour, only because he was struggling a little bit at the beginning of the PGA season. And there could be myriad reasons, and you can make up whatever storyline that you want from it. Was he hurt? I mean, it's Louis. That's always on the table when it comes to Louis. Was it that he was knew he was going to the live? And listen, some people don't handle having to keep a secret really well, and that comes through. And maybe that was the case for a lot of these live guys. But he top 10 in both live events. He goes over to the DP World Tour, comes top 10 in Munich. It just seems like he's playing better golf at the moment. I, I, that's what I'm glad you mentioned the B, the BMW international open, right? So it's not just the live golf that he's, that he's played well at. He takes the T eight there at the BMW, which is like, okay, th- this is a lot easier to look at Louis's recent form and see there's a lot more good than there is bad. And then I agree with you something that he did seven years ago or 12 years ago at, at the old course, I don't really care about other than it's going to give him a, you know, maybe a couple of good vibes when he starts walking out there again. But I, I think that um, style of golf is a, is a, is a good fit. Recent form is good. A good enough fit. Course history is obviously an amazing fit. It, it, it's hard to bypass this. It's, it's a green light for Louis. Yeah. It's a buying opportunity at a guy who's going to be at very low ownership. It is funny though, because I came into the same idea as you did, as you just kind of articulate with the BMW International in Munich that, hey, the fact that he did it there, that's really positive. But, I mean, the Portland field was way better than that field. <laughs> I know, it's weird, right? But when you only play 54 holes and there's no cut and you're guaranteed however much money, it's it, it just feels different. And I think we're still trying to figure out how to reconcile uh, the golf that's being played on, on the Live Tour. Maybe once we get you know, the official strength of field numbers from the OWGR, though they can be calculated now. I mean, it's just, it's hard to kind of reconcile that against the vast majority of the other golf that we watch around the world. So that's why I like to see um, the top 10 from, from Louis, even if it was a weaker field. Tyrrell Hatton up next, someone who has experienced a ton of success at the Alfred Dunhill Lynx tournament, which actually features two rounds at the old course, not the same time of year. It's not the similar condition and it's not a similar setup, but it is the same course, which is, you know, something. It's a lot more experience than a lot of these guys have. Uh, He put in, I I love Hatton so much. This just feels like it's too expensive for me at $8,700. He's currently a yellow light for me, but I do think that a lot like the vibe that I'm getting from a lot of the guys that I'm taking. I do think that he has the creativity on link style courses to really manufacture a lot of birdies and pars where others may not. I think he does too. I was probably yellow to green earlier in the week. I think as the week goes on, I'm probably getting yellow to red, which is unfortunate. The the good news for Hatton is that he never three putts, like almost never. He's like one of the top two guys on the PGA tour. He never three putts. I do believe that he has the creativity. I go back and and kind of look at some of the 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 buckets, and he's better from the long iron ones than he is from the short iron ones. And I'm glad you brought up the Alfred Dunhill links. Um, you know, Minwoo Lee was talking about it. Um, who's played in those events? He might have won one of them at some point. Uh, and he was like, "Yeah, this is like nothing I've ever seen before here at the old course. This is completely different, completely different setup. It's so." Big baked out. It's so hard. It's so, it's so firm and fast. So I've, I've unfortunately gotten more bearish on Terrell as the weeks, as the week has gone on. Uh, on fantasynational.com slash Mayo to get 20% off any level of membership. I do have a star next to his name still currently. He's still in the mix. I don't know if I'm going to get there. Like I said, it's a yellow light on him. A guy that I 
have a red light on is up next. It's going to be Tommy Fleetwood. Not that I think old Tommy boy can't do it, but again, if we're going to try to narrow down our core, take people out of this, uh, I would rather live with Hatton than live with Tommy because it's, weirdly enough, I think that Hatton can win. I don't think Tommy can win. Uh, well, yeah, I think uh, uh, results have kind of proven that Tommy struggles winning winning golf tournaments. But I, I think that uh, this spot on the board is a really good spot to pivot away from kind of whoever the popular guy is. Um, and if that's going to be Tommy Fleetwood, who can sometimes be quite reliant on the short game and he doesn't always offer all the upside in the world. I think that that is a natural spot to pivot away from nothing really against Tommy here. He was phenomenal at the Scottish open, but this, this does not feel like a place you want to be allocating a lot of your funds to. Oh, Tommy's going to make us look foolish, Rick. I can see it now. And Feinberg just walks in to rich. Jeff just going to be throwing money at me as we talk on Monday morning about whatever the hell the next tournament is. What is the next tournament? 3M is that next? Oh, man, I've not even started to look ahead yet. It might be. 3M, Rocket Mortgage, I don't know. Fun. Maybe I'll go on vacation. Brooks Kepka. Here is an interesting one. Obviously, he has the Euro experience. Let's see him. He started on the Challenge Tour, goes up to the DP World Tour, then the European Tour. And then you just see this guy, this American guy, pop up in majors. And he's really good in majors. And... Now we're at Brooks. He's on the Live Tour. He hasn't played well since, what, the Valspar? And even then, it still wasn't all that great. I'm big red light on Brooks. I don't care how low his ownership gets. He's 50-1 to 1 currently on DraftKings Sportsbook. That number is going to go up. You, know, you always have it in the back of your mind that Brooks is going to make you look like an idiot. But if you've just been on the Brooks fade train, which I've been at all the majors, it's working out so far. With respect to Brooks, he might be cooked, Pat. Like he's been battling the injuries. There's a lot of reports that's just never like, you know, he's never really 100%. He three putts more frequently than basically everybody on the PGA tour He's ranked outside the top 150. There's not a lot of glaring stats outside of driving distance that, that he, that he does well in and distance is not really a prerequisite for success around the old course. There, there's a chance that, um, the best Brooks days are are well behind us, and and we're not going to see anything like we saw before. Uh, you and I both contribute to the Golf Digest betting article each week. He was the guy that I picked on in my head to heads. The only thing that I'm doing well this year, I think I'm like twenty and four in head to heads somehow. In that, if I only bet head to heads, then I would be fine. But I took Louis, and I'm going to bet this one too. It's Louis minus one fifteen over Brooks. I feel like that's a good yeah. bet. <laughs> Brooks, Brooks might, and he's so capable of ejecting, right? He's just so capable of starting out slowly and you're not going to get the grind from Brooks who probably has an extra hundred million bucks in the bank account right now. Like it, there's just no scenario in which I think Brooks is going to battle for me as a backer, which is really hard to then put my hard earned dollars. Up well, against. I mean, Paul and Cody talk about all that all the time on the UFC show, obviously a little bit different when you're taking shots to the head and sticking in there and fighting for your money. But you know, in the golf world, Brooks, yeah, he just doesn't seem like a, it's funny because I don't want to take Bryson either, but I feel like Bryson is going to grind it out. Bryson's going to try his damn to do well at this tournament. I can see Brooks just phoning it in if he has bad four holes. Yeah, because Bryson's like a golf nerd who loves playing golf and, and you know, grinds on the range all night. Brooks like, would rather do literally anything else than play golf. And uh, yeah, that's pretty worrisome. If we were to rank, let's say in the final four groups, you could inject two live guys into it just for pure viewing experience of what would be the most entertaining thing possible come Sunday. Who would the two guys be? And we'll throw Phil out because Phil is obviously okay. number one. Phil was the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Phil is the answer. <laughs> if, if you have to pick two more, like for the general viewing public, who do you think it would be? Cause I would go, I think Bryson has to be one, but then is it Brooks? Is it Reed? Is it Sergio? Is it DJ? Like, I feel like those guys are all around, but Bryson with a bullet is number one. For sure. I, I think it's Bryson and man, Reed would get everybody all hot and bothered. Um, it's a great course for Reed, by the way. Yes. Especially if it gets really windy. I, I like that. Uh, I, I, I think it's, I think it's Brooks and Bryson. I know DJ, but DJ doesn't, DJ doesn't move know, the needle. No Correct. one can't like that. He was the perfect guy to announce as the first big yes. star to go. Cause no one cared. Correct. And he's not going to say anything. He's just going, oh, I'm going to go play golf. Like he'll never get involved in the geopolitics of the whole thing. But I think, I think Brooks, who's got what four majors, uh, him and Bryson battling it out against some of the, uh, the PGA's best would be freaking phenomenal. 
So we've gone through the list of the low-owned guys in the 8,000s. Now we're at the guy everyone wants to use, Tony Finau, who's been playing some really good golf recently. Coming in good form, great open championship history. Uh, I think that uh, he and Spieth, I, I, I read this, it may have been from you, it may have been from someone else, and I might get the stat wrong, but Finau and Spieth are the only two players to appear have appeared in multiple open championship millionaire maker winning lineups. He's $8,400. He feels safe at this range, but I don't know if I can stomach like a 21% Finau is the problem. Yeah, so this is yellow slash red, probably more red than yellow for me. I I that the ownership is is obviously very worrisome. I love the fact that he's been ball striking it, but again, like is does Finau go to battle for it? Does Finau yes. figure out he, a way to put really he does. I don't know if he can put it together and win this tournament, but I feel like Tony will battle for you. And there's something with these Lynx courses that I I feel like he kind of has that around the green magic here. I, I just, I don't know. I don't see it the same way. I worry about him, um, honestly, just getting the ball in the cup any way possible. I also think his biggest strength, which is in general, uh, driving the ball far and straight is like, it's okay here. I, it's not super, I would, I would prefer super tight fairways with penal rough than, than what we're going to get, than what we're going to get this week. Uh, over the past 50 rounds, Tony Finau eighth in bogey avoidance, which was like, really? Tony Finau? That's surprising. Yeah, 17th in scrambling, uh, 14th in three-putt avoidance, uh, 7th from beyond 25 feet. I was just kind of surprised. Now, that doesn't include, like, the Masters, the U.S. Open, when we've seen him struggle in the most critical spotlight, but I just found that really interesting and not something that I would have anticipated if you just, you know, gave me a blind resume. Who is this guy? It would not have been Tony Finau when I looked at the stats. I understand why he's a popular play. He is yellow for me, but I'm leaning more green than red, unlike you. Sungjae is up next, a very confusing player for me because I loved him at the PGA Championship, but then he got Andercurst and his whole career has like, gone sideways the past two events. It's a great buy low spot on Sung Jay for something that he should do really well at it. Of course he should do really well at it. I mean, he doesn't make a ton of bogeys. He's probably not ever going to win, you know, at minus 27 at the Burbasol. But if this does play a little bit tougher, I like Sung Jay. He's a yellow for me at the moment, but I could be talked in or out of him depending on what I do with these other guys right below him. I I believe he's yellow slash green. I agree with you that this is a perfect buy low spot. You know, he had two bad events in a row where it was kind of uncharacteristic for him to lose strokes on approach. He hits such a heavy a heavy ball that if if things do kick up, it's it's hard to get concerned about Sungjae. He's he three putts more often than I would like, but when you start looking at the uh, the makeup of this area of the board, uh, giving you an opportunity to get, you know, maybe from Tony Finau to Sung JM, something like that. I'm, I'm at least a little bit enticed by that. So I'll go yellow, lean green. I, I'm yellow, leaning red only because Corey Connors is next at $8,300. And everything I've said about short game magic and all that, I'm throwing it out the window with Corey Connors. I am just looking at how, how uncharacteristically well he has played at Augusta National so far in his career, which just boggles my mind, does not make any sense whatsoever. But there he is every single time. He just keeps popping up at Augusta National. He's 15th at the Open Championship last year. Maybe it's, I don't know, like the, the super fast greens at Augusta. I don't know how the greens are necessarily going to play this week. They could be wind affected. They could be rain affected. But you would think this would be the worst possible situation for him with lag putting and everything that comes into play. And it certainly was at the Scottish last week. But I think ball striking wise, if he can really kind of pick it up this week, I, I feel really good about his chances. Yeah, this is a this is a green green light. Now, you know, I think he's gained strokes in seven of his last twelve uh, in putting, which which is something you wouldn't really consider. It's not a ton, obviously, but um, it, it shows you that it's there, right? If he just if he hits it from tee to green like he normally does, and then gains two strokes with the putter, like he's in the mix. Clearly, he's better with his wedges than I think we give him a lot of credit for. I, I'm with you, Pat. Another very kind of. Um, I think he's a higher floor guy, right? We've seen him pile up top 20s for the last three years, it feels like. And I think he's putting better now than he has in in quite some time. Yeah, I just, for whatever reason, I, I think this course is going to suit his eye. And I, you're right, from 125 and in, he just doesn't get to that range as often because he's not as long as a lot of these players. But as you mentioned, if it's really baked out, like his accuracy is going to give him more distance rolling it down this fairway. 
Yeah. And, and I mean, these, these holes aren't very long, right? I mean, there's nowhere they have, they've added 13 yards to this golf course from 2015. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to build this out. So, uh, there, there's going to be a lot of shots from 125 and in for, for all of these guys, which is definitely a benefit to Corey Cox. Bryson 8,100 yeah. bucks. I want to be green light so badly on Bryson this week, but I'm just, I'm out. I'm red light. You have to be red light. I mean, realistically, what's what case could we make for Bryson other than he drives four or five par fours? Well, I, I think that's the case, that he bombs the greens <laughs> and he gets to every par five and two and he putts like peak Bryson. Okay. Well, we haven't seen a putt like peak Bryson in a very long time. Uh, he sprays it wildly off the tee despite hitting it very far. And all we want to talk about is creativity and the artist and having a million different shots. That is like the complete price is trying to remove that from his game. He's trying to be a robot. He's trying to be the technician. He's trying to be the mechanic. He's trying to remove all variables. The open championship is only variables. There's just like, uh, if you can clip this, there's zero chance this guy contends this week, right? It, it would make no sense. I can see the path and I agree with you. It's, it's the around the green that will seemingly light him up here. Maybe his can, clubs are all the same length. Maybe maybe you can figure out how to putt from 30 yards out. I think if you gave I, I actually trust okay, so I trust Bryson where if we played it at, at the old course every single week, he would eventually figure it out because he would he would do all this crazy stuff and pull a hybrid from 80 yards and roll it out. Like he'd figure that out. But when you do it once every seven years, it's like throwing a grain of sand in the motherboard. It's going to fry him. I just, th I just think it's going to completely fry him. A lack of wind, I think, would be especially helpful to him in this situation. But, of big course, time. we can't project that out. Right, yeah. B big, big time, I think, that less variables are always better for Bryson. He's trying to play a math problem. And when you start adding in more, uh, I think it gets a lot more difficult for him. And the player who's not necessarily the exact opposite, but I think once you add external elements to things, I think that Neiman at $8,000 becomes a guy that you do want to target. I'm yellow on Neiman at the moment because I see him picking up a lot of popularity, but Homa is lurking right there to soak up a lot of that ownership. I would prefer it if this was like a disaster in terms of weather with Neiman, as weird as that sounds. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, I I think I'm probably yellow closer to green um, on on Neiman. He's got the the shot shape that you would like. He's he's putting it a little bit better than he was. He's kind of slumping with the flat stick a couple of months ago. He's trying to figure that out right now. And this is I think this is going to remind me, Pat, a lot of Royal Melbourne from the Presidents Cup, and that's a generally I think a pretty good style for for Joaquin and some of these other guys who can kind of do the things that he can do so I'm I'm pretty bullish on him I'm excited to see how he does out there just from like remove my remove my investment or potential investment in him like I'm just kind of interested to see how he handles it well Max Homa as I mentioned is probably going to soak up a lot of ownership in a grouping with Tiger Woods this time around uh, that's probably not great for your psyche when you're just being followed non-stop although he's probably pretty used to it being on social media as much as he is with a camera in his face I like Mad Max here 7900 bucks. He's a yellow. Unfortunately, with the ownership, I'm leaning red because I don't see a huge differentiation between the guys $300 and above and $300 and below. And if one guy is going to be like 20%, I'll just take my chances elsewhere. Yeah, that's the problem. You know, you're going to get so many better pivot spots. I'm such a fan of Max and, and what he's and what he's done this year. And the fact that he's $7,900 is, is criminal. He's been one of the better ball strikers that we have on tour for the last 50 rounds. He's plugged the leaks in his game around the green. He's putting better. He was impressive enough at the, at the Scottish Open. He got to five under at one point before uh, the back nine kind of costing him there. I... I I wish he wasn't playing with Tiger. I wish he wasn't 20% owned. So I have to live between yellow and green because if this, if you removed ownership and tea time, um, I'd be bright green. Unfortunately, I know we can't do that. Yeah, so I'm yellow leaning red at the moment. Robert McIntyre, the Scotsman, who really screwed me over last week at the Scottish Open, is up next. Back-to-back -back top tens at Open Championships. That's always a positive, and the poor performance last week actually kind of got everyone off of him. He seems relatively mispriced at $7,800, but I like him. I'm going to use, he's a green light for me. I'm going to go back to Robert McIntyre. He is my main pivot off of Max Homa.
Okay. I, I do think he's an interesting pivot because you mentioned the open championship uh, history, which is something I, I don't want to look past. I do worry that he's not driving it as well as we've seen him drive it at times. But again, maybe that doesn't hurt you so much here at the old course. So I'm probably a firm yellow, which means I probably won't have much exposure to him whatsoever, just with the way everything is shaping up. But I could see it being an interesting buy low option. Cameron Young's an interesting buy low option this week because he has been yeah. bad since the final round at the Memorial. Is is it just over for him? Man, that would be pretty surprising. This guy was about to be the runaway rookie of the year. And then, yeah, one one bad round uh, seems to have broken him. Um, and I wish he had, you know, maybe if there was a lot of time in between you know, his last start and he was able to get home and get right. I think his dad is actually his, his, his coach and, you know, maybe get right, but just played the Scottish open. Didn't play well. I'm, I'm quite worried. This, this, this has to be a red for me on a guy that I, that I really like. He doesn't, he doesn't avoid three putts very well either. Yeah, so red light for me on Cameron Young. Mark Leishman, who lost in a playoff at St. Andrews to Zach Johnson, along with Louis Oosthuizen in 2015, is back up. We know that he likes playing in the wind. It just, I don't know. Like, Leishman's a really difficult one for me to figure out. It just feels like he comes T27. That would be my guess for Mark Leishman this week, which is great. But will he do enough scoring to get us there? Does he have enough upside that he could potentially win? What's the downside? Because obviously we know his driving is just absolutely horrible. But again, like you said, that might not matter as much here. I do like the Aussie angle you picked up on, though. I yeah, that that is a pretty fun little one. Um, I always I never get Leishman right. I can tell you he's been just slightly better than a tour average player for the last handful of months. Uh, in places that you think he's not going to do well, he seems to play well, and vice versa. So I'm I'm a yellow slash red on Leishman. I'll never get to him, but um, yeah, maybe there's that Royal Melbourne angle, but I won't be a part of it. $7,700, another Aussie, and one I am a green light on. I'm rolling with Adam Scott. Yeah, this feels a little bit better, right? He gains four and a half strokes on approach at the U.S. Open. He gains eight at the Memorial. Just the ability to kind of peak and do that is something that we've seen from Adam Sp Adam Scott a couple of times in the last couple of months. Now, he's capable of coughing up a bunch of strokes around the green or coughing up a bunch of strokes on the green. But um, this is a, a, a style of golf that is going to ask for experience. And that is exactly what Adam Scott has. Yeah. Even just looking where he loses the majority of his strokes around the green, they're at courses with like really thick rough. That's not going to be an issue for him here. He, yeah, and he's lost strokes to the field at an Open Championship once in his career. He missed the cut in 2019. Otherwise, he's been he's been pretty darn good. So um, I will say uh, green light on, on Adam Scott. Webb Simpson is up mm. next. This could be the key to unlocking this entire Open. Not really. But when I ran, I went and looked at the Fantasy National Simulator for win equity, he rated out really, really highly. On paper, this should be perfect for Webb. And he had actually been playing quite well, ball striking wise, at least, especially with his irons until the John Deere classic when he was God awful. I don't know what to make of that, but no one is going to use Webb Simpson whatsoever. We know he's, he's won a U.S. open. The guy has major upside and around the green. I don't worry about him on the greens. I don't worry about him. I'm still a yellow though. Unfortunately, where the only place you can worry about Webb Simpson when he's at his best is that he will lack distance. I don't think that's a problem here. When he gets a, a wedge in hand or a short iron in hand, maybe for him, uh, he's pretty deadly. Now we're not seeing the, the consistency from Webb that we've seen over the last few years in this current version of him, but I think he's shown enough to show us that it's still in there. He's only ever missed one cut at an open championship. I'll, I'll live between yellow and green. I'm pretty bullish here on, on Webb. All right, I think you may have just bumped him into green. He's getting the star on Fantasy National. The Mexican Allen Iverson, Abraham Answer, Live Tour's own Abraham yeah. Answer is a big red light for me here. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I I think he's my green light guy. Um, really? All right. So yeah. So I mean, I, um, there's a couple of things that he that he does well. One, the lack of distance is 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 not going to be a concern. Uh, he is basically like the 
best uh, lag putter on tour. So if you kind of start looking at like three putt avoidance, there's also a stat called approach putt performance, which basically says how close do you leave yourself after your first putt? He's like top five in that. He's just a very good lag guy. And I think that when you give him a wedge, uh, they're not always great, but like his biggest weakness, which is lack of distance, I don't think is going to be a problem. I, I think he's one of these live guys that uh, I would actually prefer to roll out. I think it now comes down to how many guys in this upper seven do I want to play? Do I like him? More? And I think it's a very compelling case that you made. I mean, he's now just been switched to yellow for me after I was just like, nah, pass on answer. <laughs> do I like him more than Webb Simpson? I'm probably going to say no. Do I like him more than Adam Scott? Probably no. I would rather gamble on Robert McIntyre under these conditions. You do make an interesting case, though. And I, I need that now put him back on the radar, I think. I mean, he had a top 10 at the PGA if we're giving him credit for the 11th in Portland. I mean, there's, it's not like, I mean, there's a reason he's going to be pretty low owned and I'm not, you know, sprinting to bet him, but I, I think I see a, I think I see a path for, for Abraham. Do you see a path for $7,500 Billy Horschel? No, I don't either. I'd like and, it though. And Billy, yeah. I, I mean, I just, I like the guy and he's, and he's definitely wet, like way under respected, right? He does not get enough credit for the wins that he has and how well he plays. But again, no one has ever described Billy Horschel as a creative golfer or an artist or anything like that. He's neurotic over the ball, which in some cases is fine. And this one, it's not, it's, it's probably why his open championship record isn't great. I just, I don't see the path for Billy. I couldn't imagine that's not necessarily a worse layout for him, but it's a lot like his. Uh, he struggled at the Open in his career. He struggled at Augusta in his career at places where you can kind of spray the ball around a little bit and not have it have too much of an effect. Not always the best for him, like tree-lined courses where if you miss the fairway, you have real problems because he's not missing a ton of fairways. That type of course sets up so much better for him. Yeah, I'll just I'll just find Billy at Wyndham or a playoff event. I I can't, I can't imagine a scenario in which he's truly you know making enough noise at the Open Championship to matter. How do you feel about Paul Casey? Who knows? He hasn't played golf. He hasn't pl he has not played golf since the match play. And and to say he played golf that was two holes, and then he conceded his his matches to everybody else. So we we literally have zero idea about the status of Paul Casey in the last four months he's withdrawn from multiple pga tour events citing a back injury maybe pat it was just because he was going to live and he's pulling the wool over our eyes i don't know but um i could not possibly with any confidence uh roster paul casey yes i mean paul casey hurts your feelings in the best of times what's gonna happen now <laughs> right, right. When, when he's been playing great he finds a way to screw you over it literally literally the last time we saw him play a, a healthy competitive round was the final round of the Players' Championship. He drove it into that divot on 18. He finished third. That was it. That was in March. Tiger Woods is up next. Yeah. Same price as Paul Casey. I bet Raza and Tambo that Tiger Woods would score more fantasy points on DraftKings this week than Paul Casey. Do I want to use wow. him in my lineups, though? He's a yellow for me at the moment. I think that Tiger is going to have a pretty good week, to be perfectly honest with you. They accepted that that wager. They offered it to me. Oh, you're on the right side of this, my friend. Um, so okay, there's a lot here on Tiger, but I guess it's I guess it's well worth it. So by far, this is the best major championship setup he's going to get this year, and maybe ever. The 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 nature of the old course being incredibly flat allows Tiger to keep his body in shape. It's why he's already played uh, at this point. You and I talking about, he's played like 55 practice holes already this week. It's, it's crazy how much he's been out on the golf course. Um, it's a creativity thinking man's course. It is not going to punish him for not being as long as he used to be. He has all the shots around the green. Uh, I had a bunch of more of, okay. The only concern I have Pat, uh, and I'm very bullish on tiger. I bet him to make the cut. I think he probably, I think he can finish inside the top 25, He's not like a prolific birdie maker anymore. So when you start looking at what he needs to do to pay himself off at 7,500 bucks without a bunch of birdies or an eagle, like what does that finishing position look like to you? I don't know is the thing. Can he get really hot with the putter here? Yeah. I think so too. He's the, he's the best lag putter ever. And that's all he ever talks. He has said the key to say, to the old course is lag putting. He, I watched him hit 40 greenside chips from 40. He was hitting four iron to three feet, wedge to two feet, uh, like putter. He's got every shot in his game. 
around these around these greens. He's he's so much better mentally than everybody else here. It's funny that each year at the Open Championship, we see the old guy. You're like, man, I can't believe that guy's in contention. But Tiger's actually the old guy now. He's that guy. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. And and I I, I think I think he's going to have a great week. Um, I think you've got to have higher expectations for this week than, than the Masters and for the PGA Championship. Uh, also, knowing he has nine months to get ready for Augusta National next year, he can leave it all out there. I just worry if he makes enough birdies for a fantasy format. If he finishes T22, I'd be like, yep, that makes sense. But I don't know if that's enough, Pat. The issue is, let's say he does run a hot putter and he starts making birdies. He might be like 4% owned. Yeah, which which really? Like, I, I have a similar number, but like, really? Do you Tiger, have, Tiger I, at the old course? I don't know if I believe the projections, <laughs> but... I just, I think a lot of people are thinking similar lines too. It's either Tiger is cooked. I don't like Tiger because there's that contingent of people too. The Tiger is cooked or very simply, can he score enough DraftKings points to lead you through? I think it is upside. He can. Like what if Tiger isn't T17? He's T6. Yeah. Finishing position points go a long way. And if, um, and if he's T6 and he's been making birdies. For sure. I, I would, I would lean, uh, v- Closer to green than yellow. I, I'm very excited about Tiger about Tiger's chances this week. I'm green. Let's go. I'm Let's also go. I'm also currently green on Justin Rose. Can you talk me out of that one? Uh, I don't think I can. I'm probably like a firm yellow here. Um, I'm not generally a rosy guy. He's very well. Maybe I'd be closer to red. He's pretty reliant on the flat stick. Doesn't doesn't strike it well. He coughs up a lot of strokes around the green. I I'm probably closer to red, Pat. I actually like him around the green for this particular event. And when you mentioned lag putting, if Tiger's the best in the world, Justin Rose is pretty damn close. Uh, and true. and he, a lot like Tiger, he's now becoming sort of this old guy that this is going to be the major where he still has a chance to compete. Uh, and he, man, he almost fired a 59 in Toronto a few weeks back. Like he still has some left in the tank. The issue is what we saw Saturday at the Scottish where when he doesn't have it, it gets bad quickly. Yeah, there's there's certainly a level of experience that I like at an open championship and and Rose has it, but um I, I won't I won't be investing in him. Will you invest in Seamus Power? When I did the research show, his name just kept popping up everywhere in everything like key that I was looking at. Obviously he's from Ireland, uh, so maybe he has a lot of a experience on link style courses. Uh, I like Seamus Power a lot. He's performed really well so far this season in a lot of the big events. Nothing great, but very consistent, very steady, and he's pretty cheap. There's only like, uh, I think there's 12 guys who have made the cut at every major this year. Seamus is one of them, and I think he's got like the six most uh, strokes gained in those events. He's very good from 125 yards and in. He's not very long, as we talked about. Not necessarily a requirement. Yeah, fire him up. Let's go. Green light Seamus Power. Okay. Patty Reed. Red light, green light. Uh, the worse the condition, the greener the light for me, if that makes sense. I understand that, but like, what if it's just what we're looking at right now in terms of wind, where you get gusts up to like maybe 20, pretty flat throughout the course of the day. Like everything that we've described with Cam Smith or Speeth or whatever it is, it kind of applies to Patrick Reed. He's awesome from 125 and in. Dude can chip, dude can putt. That's what you need here. Yeah. Um, yellow slash green i'm I'm definitely more bullish like if we just talk right now i'm like a uh, yellow green if it gets harder i'm like a green i also could see a path where he just scorches earth with the the flat stick and uh the the wedges like it, probably comes back feeling like the villain nobody loves that more than patrick reed i think he could have a pretty good week uh taylor gooch is next who is a big green light for me he was another one like seamus power who just kept popping up everywhere that I looked. Uh, he did not perform well at the U.S. Open, but he'd been pretty consistent before that. His lack of distance, I mean, he's not a lack of distance. He's just not elite in terms of driving distance. So that won't play that big of a factor for the Gucci man this week. I bet him at 200 to 1 to win this tournament. You know what? I saw him at like 250, and I'm going to go back and click it. I, I'm with you. I, I, I'll, I'll take a green on, on Gucci. The, you mentioned it earlier, like this kind of forgotten, don't want to play these, these live guys. Well, Gooch has been generally very good for the last year. He misses the cut at the U.S. Open. It's the first start back after Live London, which is like, I don't know, man. It could have been a weird situation for him, uh, but he still was great on approach, great in the ball striking categories, gave it all back, and then some in the short game. I I don't know if he has the the winning, like, is he going to win an Open Championship? Probably not, but I, I would not be at all surprised to see him finish 
14th and earn you a lot of fantasy points. Mito Pereira is very Andrew Curse. He is the owner of three consecutive missed cuts. Feels like he may have peaked in terms of at least upside consistency at the PGA Championship and let it all go to hell on the 72nd hole. Strangely enough, he's a lot like Will Zalatoris in that I think I like him better if the winning score was going to be minus five rather than minus 15. Yeah, this one's tough. I, I love Mito, but it has to be a red light for this week. You know, the the two the first two missed cuts weren't a, a big deal. The U.S. Open, the Travelers, I think he missed them both on the number. It's not a horrible thing, but he just punted it away on Friday at the Scottish. And now you look at it, it's like, oh, my God, he's hasn't made a weekend since the Memorial. And the advanced metrics that I could kind of write off before are now starting to feel more like a trend. And if he's capable of hitting his floor on uh, on a Friday and like it's just it's 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 starting to build to be too much uh, for me to handle. And there's other guys here that I like. So Mito has to be a red light. And he's not going to be unpopular either. He'll be relatively right. popular. Not, not chalky by any means, but he will be a relatively popular selection. Keegan Bradley up next. Uh, as Paul pointed out, uh, it doesn't look like Scotland's an extension of the northeast of the USA. Uh, can confirm that is uh, that is true. Paul is all all over that. I you know you look at the strengths and weaknesses of Keegan, and it kind of goes back to that. I, I wish I wish he was going to hit longer shots in. Um, I, I wish that he could putt. <laughs> like there's a lot of things that I wish about Keegan. The, this the idea of him winning an Open Championship just just doesn't sit well in my brain. I don't know how he does it. Um, I'm out. Red light, Keegan. Red light Keegan for me. How about Jordan L. Smith? So you don't get him confused with Jordan Q. Smith, I suppose. Thank you. He has been playing relatively well. And you'd have to think this link style setup is really good for him. He's 0 for 1 at Open Championships, but he was top 25 at the Genesis after a really poor Sunday. He's finished inside the top 10 at a PGA Championship in the past on a really nice run on the DP World Tour throughout the course of the season. I expected him to get really popular based on where he was on the leaderboard at the Scottish, but just a flame out on Sunday, I think killed all that. I like him. Yeah, he's a Englishman, right? Uh, who Correct. who gets to yeah who gets to go out there and he plays in a lot of conditions like this. And if you start to look at worldwide stuff, he's very comfortable on the first page or two of the leaderboard. Um, I'm with you. I mean, he's he, he piles up top twenty fives worldwide. Uh, and and this is someone that I thought earlier in the week would be more popular. So give me like light green. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, it's gonna be green for me. Seven consecutive top twenty fives coming into this event. Ryan Fox, who. Had one of those trends coming in. He didn't quite get it done at the Scottish, but he didn't blow you up at the same time. He is someone that, if he had performed well at the Scottish, would have been like 30% owned this week. That wasn't the case. So now he's not. Will you go back to Ryan Fox? Yes. So eight straight top eights on the DP World Tour. Then he had that Scottish Open. T47, it was fine. I think this is a better setup for him than the Renaissance Club, right? Great. I mean, I think that... Yeah, I mean, there's there's little rough. He's going to be able to dial it back. He's a big hitter. Dial it back to whatever number that he that he wants. Um, well suited for this for these conditions. And yeah, I'm glad. Like I'm glad he made the cut, but didn't do anything crazy at the Scottish. And we now uh, kind of keep keep everything in check for Ryan Fox. I have Woodland and Willett written down here as individuals that we could potentially highlight. I like both of them. I'm yellow on them at the moment. Is there anyone else left in the sevens? I mean, Moronkadonk's right there. Thomas Peters, I really like this week. They're both yellows for me. Peters is the strongest one towards a green for me at the moment. But is there anyone just that deserves honorary mention here? Harris English, maybe? Um, I, I think Harris English is a little bit interesting just because it looks like he's healthy again. And when he's healthy, he gains across the board. And that's that's all good. Kind of same thing with Gary Woodland. Gary Woodland looks healthy again, which is always good. Um Sahith Tagala is is 7100 and he is a very he's a very feel player pat uh which I think can go great at an open championship and I think could also go horrible and we've now got a fifth place finish at the memorial a runner up at the travelers a 16th at the John Deere I'm getting more and more excited about his game so I I would lean on the green side for for Sahit I just think he's too expensive in this field He should I don't be know. like I mean, Polter seventy one hundred. Sure, I mean, Pol Pol he... Polter is equally at overpriced. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, he, I feel like he should be like sixty six hundred bucks. No, he's got three top twenties in his last four starts. Who, who in the sixty six hundred dollar range has that? Keith Mitchell. 
Keith Mitchell stinks. No, I actually like Keith Mitchell, but I don't think his strengths are are great here. Oh, he Keith has Mitchell's... Keith Mitchell. Oh, has... much... Keith Mitchell has that uh, that the the St. Andrews tie. I think his dad was worked here, was a member here, or something like that. He's going to be pretty popular this week. I actually like Keith Mitchell though. I just think that. It's going to work out for old Keith at $6,900. Just even his form coming in, he hasn't missed a cut since the Wells Fargo. Two top tens in his past three starts. Played pretty well at the Genesis last week. I know that his distance gets mitigated here, but he's been putting the lights out, and I I really hope that continues. (laughs) He's been putting the lights out. I hope it continues. That's like the guaranteed thing to regress. I need three putts like three times as more as much as anybody else on tour. Um, I love Keith. I think this is a really bad spot for him. I hope I'm wrong. I'd love to see him contend, but this is a, this is a red light. All right. So $6,900. And what I'm going to bet to win because you know, I'm just all the way back in on how Tong he mm. could, he could not putt last week at the Scottish. Mm-hmm. Although if you look at his performances at both the open and at the Alfred Dunhill links tournament from the old course, you extract that data only. And all of a sudden he's looking a whole lot better. You just need like an average putting week. Cause the ball striking is back to being what how Tong used to be. Yeah. And he's, and he's popping for good results. Um, th- this is not only a cool story, but like, I, you know, the, the, the stats are coming back to how Tong is, finding his game again stoked stoked for him so i i probably won't get there pat i, I have not invested in him uh i think it's a fair price i'll i'll probably just pass on it but it, it is exciting to see him playing better i am full green light on how time the last of the people i wanted to bring up to profile individually i have no idea what the ownership is going to be on tom kim do you have a guess oh is, it, is this just a pure Twitter bubble thing or is this happening? Yeah. So how much does the Twitter bubble make up? Could it be like four? Could he, could he get to like 4% from a Twitter, from a Twitter bubble? Oh, I was going to say, I, I was going to guess he comes in at like 8%, 9%. Oh, well split the difference. Cause I hadn't met, I haven't met six right now. So six, somewhere between four and eight. Should we just play it? Do we just play him or do we just blindly fade him? What's the move with Tom Kim? Because I don't know. He's he's the most yellow of the yellows in terms of how I feel about him. Like, I want to play him, but everything is telling me to not play him. Uh, I think you play him. Now, he is... So, I think a lot of people thought that he played his way in last week with the third play. He didn't. He was already in because he's been crushing it on the Asian tour, which, uh, listen, we can argue strength of field and all that fun stuff. There's a lot of guys here who've got in through open qualifying who are not up to the standards of, of, of Tom Kim and, and what he's able to do on the PGA tour. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm more green than you. I'm, I'm definitely headed towards the green side of things. Okay. I'll, I'll talk it through with Tambo tomorrow. Cause I mean, he was the one who really sold me on Tom Kim last week. Help me out. My DraftKings line. I'm not going to lie to you. A third place finish will do that from a guy who's down in the $6,000 range. T23 at the U.S. Open. It really worked out well. And hopefully he can continue this momentum going forward. Because it looks like he's it looks like he's a real player that we're going to see a lot of. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think I think it's kind of um, describes what the state of the game is right now. I mean, the game is very deep all over the world. And there's a lot of good players. And once guys get an opportunity to show that and potentially uh, secure a tour card, like you're going to see more and more of these guys that I think a couple of years ago, we would have been like, ah, man, that's a blip from like the Asian tour or the European tour. But like, no, these guys are legit good. Yeah. Tom Kim isn't that guy with the crazy swing. Put it that way. Oh, yeah. What was his name? Song. No, now I can't remember. I he got the invite to remember. Pebble Beach. It was fun. Rest of the six. It was definitely fun. (laughs) Yeah. Rest of the sixes. Here's the guys that I have yellow feelings about right now. Lucas Herbert. Stuart Sink. Mackenzie Mm. Hughes. Sam Mm. Horsfield. The Burmista Mm. Mista lady. Dean Burmista. And uh, Thirsty Lawrence, who I did bet at 400 to 1 to win this tournament. I will be using Thurston Lawrence at $6,500. What do I know about him? Not much, but he's played well the last two weeks in the Rolex series. That's all you need to know. Um, two two good weeks, four hundred to one. Okay, so so Mackenzie Hughes is interesting. He was definitely on my short list. He missed the cut at the Scottish. That stopped a, a streak of of pretty good play. And he finished sixth at the Open Championship last year. The other one, Pat, that I thought was interesting was Emiliano Grillo, who was runner up at the John Deere Classic. Hits a very heavy ball, which is probably why he's got two top twelves in his last five Open Championships. And ever since he had that, he had a baby slump, the opposite of baby swag. Not many guys go into the baby slump, but Grillo did. Seems like he's breaking out of that. I, I like his play. He's generally pretty darn good on on coastal courses, thanks to the ball striking ability. I, I'd go to I'd go to Grillo here. 
Oh, yeah, I see you're just representing Ben Raza on the show right now. Yes, he was. He paid me to uh, to rant about about uh, Grillo there. Are, are there others down here? Like, there's a lot of compelling names. Even someone like Chris Kirk, I could see coming T nine this week. Yeah, or like, uh, I mean, Wyndham Clark's been playing well, right? Wyndham Clark was. I feel, was, I feel like that's the stuff. biggest trap in the world. Wyndham Clark. There's oh, a really? lot of pe- there's a lot of people digging Wyndham Clark right now. Oh, if 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 uh, Wyndham is the flavor of the week, then uh, you should probably not be playing. Straka, any Euro what guys up? like Dietrich ended up. I mean, he continuously plays well at the Renaissance Club. Can he play well here? Bland, feel like can play well in these conditions. Marcus Armitage, who just I think is a fun story, and just he played himself into this tournament. I, I mean, who was it last week who just popped off the charts? Brandon Wu got himself into this tournament with a great week. And he had a good week before that. Uh, and he's a talented, accomplished collegiate golfer who has experience with all the guys that he's going to be playing with. That was one name. John Catlin's been pretty good as well. He's actually an American who plays on the DP World Tour, but he's got a fourth place finish at the Irish Open. He had two tw- top 25s immediately before that. He's been piling up top 25s basically all all summer. Uh, and I think he's $6,100. Yeah, I, I don't know who my most own guy is green wise that's going to be in a lot of my lineups but for whatever reason i liked what i saw last week and when i think about what he does well i think it really suits st andrews it is stewart sink and he is another like old guy that can still kind of compete here like you get him from 124 yards he's like 10 feet from the from the pin that's not bad yeah that's that's not bad he is um likely more likely to contend here than a lot of places just because of the nature and the style of his game. But yeah, I could, I could see that if, if Stuart sink was inside the top 12 at some point, I'd be like, Oh yeah, that makes, that makes total sense. He's not that far removed from a two win. Was that just last season when he won twice? Yeah. You know, feels like a while ago. Do you know he's 49 years old? Yeah. Cause I remember the first win was like, all right, well, I've got my card until the champions tour. Uh, and then he won like a couple weeks later. I was like, Oh, maybe he's legit again, but uh, he play he plays well enough at times. Well, sir, we do we added the players this year for the player by player breakdown, but we're done for the year. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I know that people really enjoy this at Rick run good on Twitter. Tell everyone what they need to know from you this week. Yeah, Rick Run Good on Twitter, Rick Run Good YouTube channel for analysis and uh, videos, and rickrungood.com for stats and data and visuals and all that fun stuff. But Pat, it's a, a pleasure as always. I can't believe what we so we did five of them this year. Wow. Okay. Very, very excited. I can't believe it's it's nine months until the next major. Yeah, we'll be having a we'll be having a baby at the Masters, essentially, is what you're saying. <laughs> Perfect. Love that. <laughs> anyway, thank you again to Rick. Go check out the Rick Run Good YouTube channel, rickrungood.com, and at Rick Run Good, or as I called you, Dick Sprintwell, which is uh, just a nickname that I want to stick with. I don't know if it's going to stick, but I do like it a lot. I hope it does. I think I'll start a band and and name and name it that. Uh, it's uh, it definitely caught my attention and I definitely loved it. So hopefully it sticks. There we go. At the PME for me on Twitter, sub to the newsletter. You can find all the giveaways, play in the listeners league, and smash the like for the episode and go leave those Spotify and Apple reviews. Those really help this time of year. Thank you all for watching. I shall return with Tyler Tambellini at 9:15 a.m. Eastern Time Wednesday morning to answer your questions and make the final picks. So until then, I'll see you next time. Family experience! Experience!